Good afternoon. Let's begin lecture. We have uh, shh, shh, If you see me giving you the hairy eyeball, that means. Okay, uh, interesting quote from Sir Winston Churchill. The truth is incontrovertible. Malice may attack it. Ignorance may deride it. But in the end, there it is. The truth, that is the thing for which we seek every day here in the university and in this world. In this class, our quest is defined pretty much by Galileo. We are trying to find the truth and express it for this grand book, the universe. And that being the case, it is true that there's a lot to explore. And we are about to start with some stuff that is really, really... Um, powerful. We're talking about waves, and this will take us all the way down into the deepest parts of the quantum world. And that's, as I say, it's good to be humble and to realize that as much as you have learned, as much as Sir Isaac Newton has learned, there's an ocean out there and a mountain range and a universe to explore and to find out about. Now, Let's look back down the mountain a little bit, where we came from last night. Homework brain burner, homework 15. One of the things that I did yesterday in office hours, I was working with several students, and everybody was, you know, how do you do this brain burner? And we kind of mapped it out a couple different ways, and this seems to be a good way. I, we, we had the student, one of the first hour students, morning class, we just went up to the marker board and marked out a vertical axis and put our data on there and, and then asked a key decision or a key question. How many phase transitions do you have to cross in this uh, heat melt, heat boil problem? So what you do is you look at the initial and the final target temperatures, and which for, uh, for some of you was 264 Kelvin for the initial. Uh, 387 Kelvin for the final, the target temperature, and then ask how many phase transitions do you go, go through? And so, or another way to look at it, is each temperature, Lindsay, uh, above or below one of the phase transitions? So, for instance, is it above or below the freezing point for water, 273 Kelvin? Is it above or below the boiling point for water? So that's way up here at 373 Kelvin, where all the water boils away. Okay, so at the freezing point, it all melts or it all boils, or excuse me, it all solidifies if you're extracting energy. But if you're heating stuff up, it's going to all melt at 273K. And then once it's all melted, then you keep going up in temperature as liquid water. And finally, you get up to 373, and you start boiling things away, and boil, and boil, and boil, until it's all steam, and then you can heat the steam. And that's how you've got to think about these problems. So you figure out your delta T's based on two things, the transitions, the phase transition points that you've decided on, and then the uh, final and initial temperatures. And then from that, you compute... Uh, the heating energy, Q equals MC delta T, as many times as necessary. So, for instance, here's one that you've got to tackle. This last one from 373 up to 387, so that would be a delta T of 14 Kelvin for this example. 
And then, okay, here's one that you've got down here, kind of in the middle. And key, what you've got here in the middle is if you're going all the way up from solid into the vapor state, you've got always 100 Kelvin middle delta T. So that's your intermediate one. Because you've got to go all the way from the melting point all the way up to the boiling point. And that's always 100 Kelvin, 273 to 373. And then you finally got this little teeny one down here, 264 up to the melting point. So it depends on what the numbers are. And as you may have realized, as I've emphasized many times, on the calculation questions, every time you retake the quiz, the homework quiz, in homework 15 or homework 7 or whatever quiz it is, it generates a new set of numbers for the mass, for the temperature, for all the different or some of the different quantities in the problem. Sometimes I have it set for one value, like for the initial temperature. And sometimes I have everything different. And you have to read carefully and recalculate it each time. So uh, Q equals MC delta T. In the brain burner, you had three of them, two little ones and then a big one in the middle. But the big one in the middle is pretty easy because it's 100 times 1 because one is a specific heat of liquid water, Sarah. So, and it's going up to 100, that's easy. 100 times 1 is 100. And then multiply that by the mass of uh, water that you've got, whatever it happens to be, 612 or, or whatever. And so that's an easy one to calculate. But you've got to do it. And then the other thing you have to do is you've got to figure out how much energy it takes to actually melt stuff at the melting point. That's uh, Q equals M mass times the latent heat of fusion. And then if you're going above the boiling point, you've got to boil it all away. So Q equals M times L subscript V, that is what you need to completely boil it all away. And so you, if you're trying to get above the boiling point, from below the freezing point, you've got both of these latent heats to deal with. Because you've got to melt it all, and then you've got to boil it all. all right? And that goes gram for gram. That's what latent heat encodes. Now, um, jot this down. You know, Jot this layout of how I've analyzed this stuff if you want. Put a few notes in. And as I've mentioned to students uh, in lecture, when they can stop talking uh, and pay attention. I see a guy in the back laughing. I wasn't, thought, I wasn't looking at you. I was looking at somebody four, four rows in front of you that keeps they're still talking from the beginning of class. Anyways, if you're taking notes, try to take like a skeleton set of notes and then go listen to the podcast. Look at it on YouTube and you can play it back as many times as you want and then fill in all the details, and you'll do it perfectly without having to hustle and bustle. And what did he just say? Dr. B, can you go back? And if you, if you take skeleton notes and listen more, then you'll, be, you know, you'll, you'll find that your comprehension level increases. So this diagram might help you. So jot it down and you know, kind of, you, know, you know, sometimes I solve, I use a table to solve things. Sometimes I do a diagram like this. just depends. And you may like using tables. That's good. Uh, maybe a diagram like this will help. So just, you know, be ready for whatever comes your way. There's a lot to explore. There's a lot to learn. You know, Sir Isaac Newton said that. He said, I'm like a child playing by the side of the ocean. I've found a few pretty stones and a few pretty shells. But the ocean is very, very big. The Atlantic Ocean is very, very big. And that's humility from Sir Isaac Newton, one of the biggest scientists of all time. Interesting. All right, let's do some clicking and make some decisions. You know, when you're working on these problems, everybody always says, Dr. B, what's the formula for this? Or they post a discussion thread. What's the formula for number six, homework 15? And I always say, no, don't think in terms of the formula. Think about what you are doing. What are the decisions that you have to make? I just gave you an outline. 
of the main decisions that you have to make on that brain burn. Okay, so let's see if you can make them again in a clicker question. So take out your clicker. We're on frequency BB. And let's, uh, let's proceed. You have some ice. At 250 Kelvin. Really cold. You want to heat it up to steam at 393. How many phase transitions does your H2O have to pass? This is your key decision. Let's see if you guys can sort it out. 30 seconds. forgot to tell you something. 15 seconds. I'm going to call you up in a minute. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. You know, I had a student come up at the end of class, the morning class, and he said, Dr. B, I just clicked it in. I didn't, I didn't quite make it. And I told him, you know, when I give you the countdown, you should be... I haven't closed it yet. Uh, but uh, when I start the countdown, get your numbers in. All right, here we go. I'll stop it now. Let's see what you guys have got. Uh-oh. Melissa, we got some splaining to do here. What? What is this? A bunch of you voted for two. A bunch of you voted for three. Uh, how many phase transitions are there from solid to liquid to ice, to solid to liquid to gas? There's only two. There's three phases, but there's only two junctions. So the correct answer here is two. And, uh-oh, so a bunch of you, so if you, if you answered three, just make a note. The phase transitions for regular water calculations, or regular anything, unless we're operating on the surface of the sun or some exotic environment like that, there's only going to be two. You might have two or you might only have one. You might not have any. If you're just going from solid to solid, you know, you'd have a cross a boundary, you might have zero. But you're never going to have three. All right, let's do another question. Same set of specs. What are your three delta T's in order from first to last as you heat from ice to steam? Do you want to change seats? It's okay if you want to. Just don't lose your clicker. You can put your stuff up on the stage if you want. If you're on the O team, 
or if you're on any team on this campus, do not let me catch you napping on this question. I bet I did. I bet I caught a bunch of you napping. 15 seconds. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Uh oh. I caught a few of you napping, but not too many. This is the right answer. If you voted for this one up here, option A, napping. Those are the correct numbers, but not the right order. 20, Kelvin, that's the last one. That's from boiling point up to your target temperature. Okay, now don't let me catch you napping like that again or you'll be in big trouble. Now, let's talk about waves. Talk about what waves do. Our main topic for the day. This is a lovely photograph. I wish this room could be darkened a little bit more so that you could see it in better color and better contrast. And even in a dark room, it's not that great of a photo. So you can make a note to yourself, ocean waves at the beach, and the beach has a breakwater. It's a breakwater. And the breakwater has a gap so that boats and swimmers can go through the gap and out to sea or come in from the high seas and beach their craft. I don't know where this is, Brazil or maybe up in Maine or who knows, Pacific somewhere. But if you look at it carefully, out here, out here you can kind of see the parallel um, crests of the waves and the troughs of the waves. They're coming in parallel. I'll, I'll kind of trace that in. See that? Okay, right in there, the waves are coming in, and they're actually, they look like they're fairly evenly spaced, right? Now, let's do a close-up. Right, there they are. Okay, it's a little bit easier to see. The waves in the ocean, if you've ever been out at the beach, you know they, they just come in one after another at a fairly even rate. And a lot of times they're coming in parallel. They might not be straight into the beach. They might be coming in at an angle they themselves are each pretty much parallel, usually. All right? And that's what we've got here. So in this particular instance, uh, make a note of it, the wave fronts are approaching almost parallel to that breakwater. Not quite. Okay? Almost, almost parallel. Now, I want to show you um, a little bit more. This is outside the breakwater. So they're coming in parallel. Everything's looking copacetic. Everything's looking spiffy. But now they're coming in basically kind of in this direction. All right, go ahead and write an arrow if you're sketching to represent the propagation velocity vector for this wave train. The H2O molecules are not moving in that direction. The H2O molecules are going up and down. But the energy that they carry is going in that red arrow direction. The momentum and energy are transported in that direction. Now, on the other side of the breakwater, you can see these wave fronts now... They look different. They're curvaceous. They're just kind of, it, it looks like right there is the source. That looks like the interaction area. And as I mentioned to you last time, I believe, uh, waves, when they interact, um, act as if the interaction area is the source of wavelets and that the wavelets uh, travel outwards. 
this area here, the interaction area, it's like the, the waves that are coming away from that into the inside of the breakwater, it looks as if they're from somebody dropping a stone into a pond. You know, if, if you have a still pond or a lake and you drop a stone or even a bathtub or the basin, you know, in your kitchen sink, you drop a stone into it or anything small, it'll cause waves to go outward, kind of circular pattern. And that's what it looks like right here. These look like they're coming. Uh, it looks like somebody's dropping a stone there right at the tip of that yellow arrow. All right? But there's nobody dropping a stone there. What's happening there is the wave is interacting with the barrier. All right? So now, in addition to them being curved, as if you're dropping a stone, the waves are now propagating in a whole slew of directions. Unlike out here, that was pretty much one direction. They were all coming from that storm out, you know, halfway to the Cape Verde Islands or whatever it is that's generating those waves. And those waves are coming in flat, all from the same direction, but no more. As soon as they interact with this, they change directions and they, they kind of bend around the corner. That, my wonderful students, is what we call diffraction. D-I-F-F-R-A-C-T-I-O-N. These waves diffract. Particles in Newtonian physics do not do this. Waves do it. They interact with that barrier and it's almost as if there's somebody dropping little pebbles in right here. And you get the same waves as if you were dropping pebbles in there, but you're not. You're not dropping pebbles. You, you, the waves are interacting. So diffraction. Here's another picture. And this is an overhead view of another uh, wave phenomena. And this time the ocean waves, it's not really an ocean, it's, this is called a wave tank, which is a flat container of water that's fairly shallow. It has a glass bottom. You shine a light through the top of it, and it goes through the water, and then shines down onto your tabletop surface below the tank. So the tank's up here, you know, a foot or two above the table. And then a foot or two above the tank is your light source. And the light goes through there, and then if you put a camera or even a piece of paper and trace, you can get an image uh, like this uh, below the wave tank or the table below the wave, wave tank. Uh, and one of the things about this is these waves are coming in from below. They're going upward. So make a note, second diagram, diffraction. Waves are going upward into the barrier. They're going parallel to the barrier, and as they go through the gap in the barrier, we get diffraction again. But notice that it's not that strong. The waves go, but go through, and it's pretty strong through here, but you don't get a whole lot off to the side, to the left or right. All right? And that is uh, because of a of set of various physical factors that we are going to talk about uh, today. So uh, the strength of diffraction, the strength of any kind of interference effects uh, is determined by a set of different physical factors like amplitude, frequency, wavelength, and we're going to talk about those right now. So basic, did we go through this slide last time? No? Yes? Maybe? Let's talk about this. We'll go through it quickly. we got time. The key concept for waves is that they transport energy and momentum across space-time. So just like those water waves, the water waves are going up and, or excuse me, the water molecules are going up and down. But the waves, they pound anything that's in the direction of their propagation vector. Okay, so the water is going up this way, but the waves break on the surface along uh, the direction of that propagation vector. For this reason, they're not easily localized. 
you can localize the mass, the momentum, and the energy of a baseball, a Newtonian particle, for a wave much more difficult. And those pictures that we showed are fairly easy to analyze, but anything more complicated than that, really, really tough. But we have ways of doing it. So they behave way different than a Newtonian particle. It, and it's as if there's somebody dropping pebbles in right at the gap in the boundary. You get wavelets generated. And one of the things about the propagation of a wave is it usually has a very simple form. The equation that expresses the wave speed is V equals lambda F. And lambda stands for the wavelength. F stands for the frequency uh, of the wave. And we're going to try to work with that and a few other physical factors uh, this afternoon. So um, the wave equation, V equals lambda F, even if you're on some exotic or in some exotic uh, environment like the surface of the sun, uh, where you have a really hot plasma, so neither solid nor liquid nor gaseous, but a, a plasma, uh, you still get plasma waves. And their wave equation is a little bit fancier than this, but you can still see V equals lambda F if you do all the physics for some fancy uh, plasma phenomenon. It's, it usually has this form. So let's take a look at some of this stuff. Okay, wavelength. Wavelength is the spatial distance between two waves, two succeeding waves, two successive waves. So from, for instance, this wave that I have diagrammed up here on the top, from this peak on the left side of the diagram to this other peak on the, uh, towards the middle of the diagram, that's one wavelength. That's a lambda. Lambda, Greek lowercase lambda, is the customary symbol for wavelength. And you can also measure it between the two troughs. You don't have to go to the crest. You can go from trough to trough. So this first trough down here, uh, there's the bottom of it. So that, that would be like if you're, if you're surfing, this is the place that you want to avoid, you know, the bottom of the wave. You're going to try to... Does anybody here surf? So... Do you like to, so surfers, do you like to be at the top of the wave or the middle of the wave or the bottom or what? Dudes, I'm, I'm asking you. I'm looking at you. Huh? You just raised. I'm looking right at you. You just raised your hand and said you surf. It wasn't that you? But I just asked you a question. The wave period, the temporal interval between waves. So if you're standing out there at the at the uh, end of the jetty or at the breakwater, and you watch the waves go by. You know, they come and they crash in, you know, or if you're at the beach, they crash in at a certain rate, so many per second. Well, the, the time interval between waves breaking on the shore, the time intervals between the waves passing you by, if you're on the breakwater or out in a boat, that is the period. Capital T is the customary symbol for it. Frequency is the inverse of that, one over the period. Okay, and the wave equation... Uh, is V equals lambda F. Lambda is the wavelength. Frequency is 1 over the period. Okay, so if you get a wave every half second, that means your frequency, that means your period is a half second, and your frequency is the flip-flop of that two, two waves per second. Okay, so light. Let's talk about light. A special kind of a wave. A light, excuse me, light waves, electromagnetic waves, 
they're not a wave in a material medium like water or sound waves in air or sound waves in water, you know, sonar waves. Uh, they're a wave in the electromagnetic field, uh, which is slightly different. We can observe them fairly easily. Compasses respond to electromagnetic waves of the right frequency. Radios, of course. Electrons and protons are the sources, usually. Any charged particle. Most of the charged particles available to us as humans are protons and especially electrons. Every electronic device that you have is, uh, what did I just say? Every electronic device you have, electrons. We're hurting all these zillions of little electrons and they're doing jobs for us and stuff. It's pretty cool. The electromagnetic radiation forms a spectrum. So there's a wide variation. That means lambda and frequency vary um, across a whole range. Now, go ahead and make a note, spectrum, and make a note that there's a, a nifty diagram here. On the left side, it shows the wavelength kind of tight down here, lower left, uh, to symbolize that gamma rays have very, very short wavelengths. And that on the other side, radio waves uh, have very, very large wavelengths. So from peak to peak over here for radio, it's a lot further. A radio wave can be on the order of 100 meters. So for instance, if you, ca if you calculate the wavelength of like 580 AM uh, ESPN, uh, you'll be t you're talking about hundreds of meters. And, but uh, gamma rays, very, very small. Okay, so the spectrum goes like this. From long wavelength, the longest wavelengths are radio. They use extremely long wavelengths. Um, radio waves to communicate to submarines or communicate with submarines at sea. You know, they have these big, huge antennas at various places around the United States, like Hawaii and Wisconsin. They can communicate with submarines way deep under the ocean water, because normally electromagnetic waves don't really penetrate the ocean very well, except at very uh, long wavelengths. Infrared, a little bit smaller wavelength, as you can see from this diagram, the visible band, Roy G. Biv. Uh, Roy G. Biv, the name of the famous scientist who donated his name to science uh, because his name is the exact order of colors in the visible spectrum. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Roy G. Biv. And then after that, ultraviolet, shorter wavelength, but higher frequency. You know, the wavelength is one thing, the frequency is another, and as wavelength decreases, frequency gets bigger. X-rays, and after X-rays, gamma rays. So this is from, in order, and it should be radio is A. Whoa, look at that. I have C, A, B, C, D. Hmm. Dr. B, I was caught napping. Anyways, A, radio should be A, infrared B, visible C, and, and on down. It, that's the order of longest wavelength to shortest wavelength. Uh, microwave, I skipped. Yeah. I mean, some people, what's infrared to one man is microwave to another man. So electrical engineers... These divisions, they're not like written in stone. So an electrical engineer might refer to one frequency or wavelength as being in infrared, and a computer scientist might say, well, that's microwave, or vice versa. And they're talking about the same wavelength. So uh, same thing with ultraviolet and x-ray. A hard ultraviolet to one scientist might be soft x-ray to another scientist. Anyways, there's infinite numbers of electromagnetic spectrum diagrams on the internet. All you have to do is type in, in Google, electromagnetic spectrum, and then hit the images button, and you'll see 
a wide variety. Some of them are pretty cool looking. So I invite you to do that. The speed of light. Customary symbol is the letter C. 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Uh, that's scientific notation. And hey, you guys, you're going to have to brush up on your scientific notation because we're going to need it for dealing with frequencies and wavelengths. Jessica, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. 300 million meters per second. Whoa, that's a lot. For us, you know, we can barely go five miles an hour without falling over with exhaustion. But for light, that's like a breeze, okay? A solar system, a galaxy, three times to the eight, eight meters per second is nothing. From the sun to earth is 500 light seconds. It takes a significant, it's not instantaneous. The light from the sun takes 500 seconds to get here to earth. So a distance unit, light second, is basically C times one second. So a light second would be 300 million meters. That's 300,000 kilometers. And multiply that, which the United States is maybe 5,000 kilometers across. 3,000 miles. Okay, so 300,000 kilometers a second is a big, big distance. And 500 of those. And then you get to the sun if you're a light particle. Okay, now, okay, so light is a wave, very special kind of a wave. And there's something that's common about every oscillating system. So let's talk about this concept. Why do physical systems oscillate? You know, the... The waves in the ocean, that's an oscillatory system. A spring that is in the suspension of your vehicle, your truck or your car, is an oscillating system. And Mr. Serrano, oscillating systems, you know, you can, you can get them to, you know, go back and forth like this, you know. You push it down and then you let go and it goes boing, 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 like that. Okay, that's oscillations. You know, if your car, if your shocks are dead in your car, and you go over a bump, you're going to go like this for, you know, for half a mile or whatever. Hopefully that doesn't happen to you. But a spring system is pretty easy to analyze. Let's analyze it. The force law for a spring depends on one thing, the displacement away from the equilibrium position. Now, what is the equilibrium position? The equilibrium is position is, you know, you buy the spring down at uh, Napa for your car or down at the Jeep dealer and you take it out of the package, you put it on the table and you measure it, that's how long your spring is. That's the equilibrium. You know, what would it be if you just set it on the table and it didn't have any pushes on it, it didn't have any pulls on it, just sitting there by itself, that's the equilibrium length. Okay? If you deviate from equilibrium... So if you squeeze it in a little bit, that takes a little bit of oomph. And speaking of oomph, I forgot about something. We have some really good news. Miss Darian is back as our TA. That's right. And she's going to help us. She's going to give us some oomph as we go through the rest of the semester. Um, she was on, she was, she's back, that's how she put it that way. I don't want to, I can't, I can't even explain what happened to her. Anyway, she's back, and she'll be having office hours. So if you want a little extra oomph in your study, 1 p.m., Mondays, physical science building next door, main entrance to Atrium, uh, 1 until 2. She'll also be coaching and discussions as she has done already this semester a little bit, and she'll be back. So thank God that Darian is back. Excellent. It cheers me up and it, it encourages me quite a bit. As you know, it's really stressful for me carrying both of these big classes by myself. It's a lot of work. 
So have a dairy and it's going to be nice. Anyway, spring, to, spring force is proportional to x. So if x measures how far away your, your spring is from equilibrium, that's going to be proportional to the force. So the more displacement you have, the more push. Okay, if you squeeze it in from equilibrium, a lot of squeeze in means the spring pushes back quite a bit. A little bit of squeeze in means that it just is a little bit of squeeze push back. If you pull it away from equilibrium, okay, you get a force back towards equilibrium, a pullback force. A lot of pull out, you know, a lot of extension more pullback force. A little bit, you're only a centimeter away from equilibrium, just a little bit of pullback force. All right? It's a restoring force. If you think about it, if, if your object is out here, okay, if this is the equilibrium position, let me get my cursor right here. Come on, cursor. There we go. If this is your equilibrium position over here, in the top diagram, x subscript 0. And then if you pull out here, the spring's going to be pulling you back. Right? And the spring force is going to be back to the left. So right here at equilibrium, this is you take it out of the package, you get it at Napa, you take it out of the package, you put it on the table, that's right here, equilibrium. No force either left or right. You pull it out to here, and you get a leftward force. And by the same token, if, you're, if your displacement is to the left, the pushback force is to the right. right? So you can um, describe the restoring force in this way. So if you have a spring system or a restoring force system, the force will, be, will always be opposite the displacement. So if X is positive for rightward displacement over here, and X is negative for leftward displacement over here, then the force law is going to be F equals minus something times X. Here's the, here's the formula for it. F equals minus KX. The minus sign means opposite the direction of x. k is called the spring constant. Let me repeat that. k is called the spring constant. It is always positive. The spring constant is rated in newtons per meter, or newtons per centimeter, if you will. Newtons per unit distance, force per unit distance. The spring constant k is positive, newtons per meter, it tells you the stiffness or the easiness of the spring. So if you've got, you know, like a car shock absorber, a, a car spring, coil spring for a car, you can't pull it apart. You can't budge it because it's designed to be compressed by a couple thousand pounds of car. Right? So, you know, it take maybe four or five of us on either end of a car spring to pull it by a centimeter. Big spring factor. A slinky, if you've ever seen a slinky, very easy to pull apart and, and bring back together. So slinky, the spring factor is smaller. Okay? So the spring factor encodes the stiffness, and the minus sign encodes the fact that it's a restoring force, always restores the object towards equilibrium, no matter where it is. If you do a little bit of calculus, or if you do the same kind of derivation as we did with the uh, distance triangle at the beginning of the semester, you know, one-half AT squared, one-half GT squared, you figure out the spring potential energy, SPE, is one-half KX squared. Now, the important thing for us in this discussion is item 2C and item 2D. The sign 
of an oscillating system is one in which you have a restoring force, F equals minus KX. Or it could be F equals minus KY if you're going vertically, or KZ if you're going forward and back, or any other dimension. Colin. Negative means opposite direction. Okay? That encodes the fact that it's always going, if your displacement is to the right, the, it's pulling you back to the left. If your displacement is to the left over here, it's going to pull you back to the right, back towards equilibrium. All right? The other sign, or the equivalent sign of an oscillating system, is potential energy that has the form uh, one half k times the square of something. If you have that, then you're going to oscillate across x or y or z or r or any other dimension that shows up in the position of x in this formula. So s equals or SPE equals one half k x squared. So those are the signs. If we see those, however they may show up, we know that we're going to get an oscillating system. The restoring force for waves in the ocean, waves in the ocean being an oscillatory system, that restoring force is gravity. If you, and just think about it. You, mean you could do all the, the calculus and trig behind it, but you could think about it. If you have a wave in the ocean, the, the top of the wave is slightly above sea level, right? And that's why waves are waves. And so the top of the wave is maybe a foot or maybe, you know, if you're out in Hawaii or Portugal or something, you know, 30 feet above sea level for the top of the wave. And then the bottom of the wave is the same distance below sea level. The restoring force, if you're at the top of the wave, is gravity. It pulls you back down towards equilibrium, sea level. If you're in the bottom of the wave, the restoring force is also gravity because gravity is trying to fill in that trough in the wave and get you floated back up to sea level. Okay? And it does that as the wave goes by. It's kind of cool. Now, let's take a look about and, f and figure out one more concept, the concept of amplitude. And we're going to use this diagram to understand that. Let's look at one full cycle. And when we do this, we're going to work through uh, and kind of talk our way through this, this set. So uh, image A uh, in this diagram shows the spring at equilibrium position, unstretched. Image B, the second diagram down, shows the spring and a, a, a brown rectangle, a brown square. That's the weight attached to the spring. That is shown at maximum extension. Okay? So at maximum extension, the spring is going to be pulling back. Um, it's way out there to the right. It's pulled back forces to the left. All right? And column, that's what I mean. If your displacement is positive to the right, the pullback force is minus that to the left. That's what that minus sign does for you. All right, here we are. Um, the third diagram right here, C, you're back to equilibrium. Equilibrium position has been restored, but if it's a spring system and there's no friction or anything like that, you're going to overshoot and you're going to go all the way here to D. And D shows max compression. Okay? The distance from max compression to equilibrium is the same as the distance from equilibrium to max extension. Let me repeat that. The distance from maximum compression here back to the equilibrium position is the same as, equal to, the distance from max extension here in image B back to equilibrium. So let's do some uh, arrows. And one full cycle means you go uh, four little journeys to or uh, away from equilibrium. So let's take a look at it. First step, you go away from equilibrium. So on the first part of this cycle, this thing's going back and forth, and we're going to start at equilibrium. And it moves to the right, 
to maximum extension. Okay, here's maximum extension right out here. And then once it reaches maximum extension, that's called the turning point in the motion. Uh, it's like apogee, except we're not, it's not gravitational, but it's a turning point just like apogee is. And then once you get to that point, you're, you're out here to the right of equilibrium, so your force is to the left, and you're going to start, as soon as you stop at max extension, with that leftward force, you're going to be pulled back this way, back towards equilibrium. So right in another arrow, same length. You're going to overshoot, but because it's a good symmetric spring, you know, you're going to get to equilibrium here, but then you're going to overshoot and you're going to head out to maximum compression, which is right here. So draw another arrow to the right. But now during this part of the motion, Darion, you're actually slowing down. You're passing by at equilibrium and you're heading over here to the left, but the force you're experiencing is the other direction to the right, so that means you're slowing down until you hit the turning point, and then your velocity and your force are both to the uh, right again, and now you're speeding up. So you get to maximum compression, and then the spring pushes you back to equilibrium, and the cycle continues. All right? And so all those four arrows uh, add up to one full vibration or one full cycle. Now, I'm going to give you a, a little... Uh, concept here that is basically derived from the laziness of mathematicians and scientists that like to do keep things as easy and simple as they can and so after doing buku trig and calculus um, it turns out that the easiest way to talk about oscillation systems oscillatory systems is amplitude and the amplitude is basically the distance from equilibrium out to maximum extension or from equilibrium to maximum compression. Okay? So any of those four arrows, now their directions are different, but any of those four arrows are the same length. Okay? That is the, the length of each arrow is the amplitude, the amplitude of the oscillation. All right, so write that word down as a vocabulary term, and it's, pr it's actually pretty important. The amplitude is related to the potential energy and the spring force. The amplitude is going to be a distance in the dimension that shows up in your spring force. If your spring force is minus kx, your amplitude is going to be some kind of a distance along the x-axis. If your potential energy is one-half kxy squared, your amplitude is going to be some distance along the y-axis, right? Waves in the ocean. Here's a sideways view, kind of an idealized water wave in the ocean. Now, the top of the wave is above sea level. So here's sea level, this blue line here, right here where I have my cursor. Okay, there's sea level, and the top of the wave is above sea level, and then the bottom of the wave, theoretically, Sarah, is the same distance below sea level. All right, so this is the calm sea. If you were out there, no wind, just a flat ocean, this is where the, the water would be. But when waves are rolling, you've got a wave of amplitude, capital A, and that could express both distances, either distance, on this diagram. Okay, so that's how you would chart out the the um, the distance A, the amplitude A. Okay. Now it turns out that for electromagnetic radiation, electromagnetic fields in general, the energy density is proportional to the square of the amplitude. So the square of the electric field the square of the magnetic field, the amount of energy. So if you have a, a, an antenna, you know, like a, a little 
flat antenna for your digital TV, the amount of energy pouring through that per second is proportional to the amplitude of the um, electromagnetic waves that your antenna is picking up. And that actually works out to be important for black holes and, and all kinds of other things in the theory of relativity. So Einstein, uh, he's the guy that kind of figured this out and it was, has had profound effects. All right, let's go and do some calculations for the last 15 minutes with electromagnetic wave equation. We're going to have another clicker question, so make sure you've got it out and ready to go. It's going to be a minute. I want to go through one calculation with you, and then I'm going to give you a calculation to try on your own. And as I've mentioned before, scientific notation, you want to brush up on this uh, and make sure you're ready to go. Otherwise, you're going to have to do everything on paper, which you could do. It's, it's not going to be too bodacious. So here's our wave equation for electromagnetic radiation, electromagnetic radiation, C equals lambda F, C being the symbol customarily used for the speed of light. And as a reminder, wavelength is spatial, period is temporal, frequency is one over the period. And hey, you guys, the unit of one over seconds, frequency is measured in uh, one over second or inverse seconds, seconds to the minus one. Uh, frequency, the fancy word for that is the hertz, H-E-R-T-Z, which if you were looking at your uh, highlights in the e-text, you would see that that was highlighted uh, this early this morning. Hertz, H-E-R-T-Z, it's named after an English, excuse me, a German scientist named Hertz, who was the first to observe uh, electromagnetic waves. No one had ever measured them before. Uh, they'd been predicted, but he was the first to measure them. So the unit of frequency is called the Hertz, HZ. And what we're going to do now is calculate the frequency for a red color of light for which the wavelength is 656 nanometers. So write down NM, 656 NM, and this is a very, very famous wavelength. NM stands for nanometer. Now, N-A-N-O-M-E-T-E-R, nanometer. What does that mean? It means a billionth, billionth with a B, B for Bravo. One times 10 to the minus 9 meters, as you shall see in just a second. We're going to change the wave equation just a bit to solve for frequency. So we're going to divide both sides by lambda. That's all right. It's good. You know, wavelengths are fairly easy to calculate in the lab with lasers and stuff. If you know the, the wavelength of the laser, you can measure a lot of really cool wa other additional wavelengths. If you're trying to figure out a wavelength, C over F is the way to go. So that's just a variation. So there's your three equations. They're all variations of the wave equation. So, uh, but we're going to use this one right here, C over lambda equals F, because we want to figure out the frequency. So here we go. Calculate the frequency of light at 656, <coughs> excuse me, 656 nanometers. All right, the top is the speed of light. Now, I've written it out as if you were writing it on paper. In your calculator, you would type in 3 and then EE8 or something like that, depending on the calculator that you have. Here is, in the denominator, the wavelength, 656 nanometers. Now, as I mentioned, a nanometer is the same as 10 to the minus 9 meters. And so you have 656 times 10 to the minus 9 meters in the denominator. Now, something I want to point out to you. 10 to the minus 9 in the denominator is the same as 10 to the regular 9 in the numerator. Okay, so this is the same as having a 3 in the numerator, 656 in the denominator, 10 to the 8, in the numerator, and a 10 to the 9 in the numerator, 10 to the 17. 
And that's why you can rewrite it in this way. Now, also, if you look here, meters on top in the speed of light, meters per second, and then meters in the denominator for the wavelength, they cancel. And so you're left with unit-wise per second out here. That's a hertz. And we're going to replace that with the symbol capital HZ for hertz. But here's the numeric part, you know, 3 and 656, 3 in the numerator, 656 in the denominator. And then 10 to the 17 over here. So if you're doing this in pencil and paper, you know, you can work it out this way. If you're on a calculator, you can type it in this way. On my calculator, I have an EE button. So my numerator here, 3 times 10 to the 17, I would type it in as 3, and then the EE button, and then 17, and then I divide by 656. And if I did that, I would come up with this answer, 4.57. And it, try it on your calculator, because you're going to have to do this in just a second on your eye clicker. 4.57 times 10 to the 14 per second. Now, I want you to write down a conversion concept. If we were turning in written work every day, writing down this answer in this way in the yellow box would be hunky-dory. I'd be able to understand it perfectly. But clicking, we want to type in an easy number. The way that we do that is by extracting um, a power of 10 from, from 10 to the 14. Now, what does the prefix kilo mean? K-I-L-O. What does that mean? Kilometer. How many meters does that mean? Thousand. Mega. What does that mean? Million. Giga. What does giga stand for? A billion. Right? Ten of the nine. Let's go the other way. Uh, centi, centimeter, what does that stand for? What fraction of a meter? Hundredth part. Milli, M-I-L-L-I, thousandth. Nano, 10 to the minus 9. All right, now, we're going to get, we've got a huge number here, 10 to the 12. So here's, go ahead and make a list. 10 to the 3rd? Kilo. And AM radio is rated in hundreds of kilohertz. Okay, so if this were AM radio, we might have an answer in kilohertz. So 10 to the 3, kilo. 10 to the 6, mega. Megahertz. FM radio is in the megahertz region. Why 96.5? That's 96.5 megahertz. Or whatever the radio station is on FM. 10 of the, okay, that's 10 of the 6. 10 of the 9. Giga, G-I-G-A. You know, gig, gigawatts, gigawatts. Your cell phones, they operate in the gigahertz region. 10 to the 12 is called tera, terahertz, T-H-Z. So write down 10 to the 12 terahertz, T, capital T, capital H, lowercase z. Now we've got terahertzes in here. 10 to the 14, that's 10 to the 2 times a terahertz. Right, so make a note of that. 10, 10 to the 14 hertz is 10 to the 2 times a terahertz times a THC. All right. What's 4.57 times 10 to the 2? 4.57 times 10 to the 2. Uh, 4.57 times. What's 10 to the 2? 
100. 4.57 times 100? 457. So this answer is in terahertz is 457. Now your clicker question, I'm going to ask you to do the same thing. Your, your, uh, when you calculate, you're going to have a number out in the 10 to the 14 hertz. And I want you to convert it to terahertz because that's a number that's pretty small, three digits. All right? And you don't have to use scientific notation. All right? So let's do it. Let's try a calculation on iClicker. And we'll try to do that and then dismiss. Calculate the frequency in terahertz of the aqua tealish color at wavelength 486 nanometers. All right, same kind of calculation. And hit the refresh button on your calculator, by the way. And let me get my cursor over here. And you're going to get a number in the hundreds of terahertz, but it's going to look on your calculator like something, point something, something, times 10 to the 14. Okay, so do the same conversion to terahertz that we just talked about. And that'll be good. Okay. Any spiders over there today? Good. Right. I know, that's those scaredy cats with the four rows back. That was so funny that day you guys saw that spider. Were you here for that spider? I am so glad you're back, Darian. I can't... I'm so glad you're back. That's a weight off my mind. Y88.3 FM. Pico is 10 to the minus 12, I believe. I can't remember what Pico is. I think it's 10 to the minus 12. You look it up. I mean, it's, you know, they have a whole set of prefixes. You know, it goes all the way up to yada. You know how people say yada, yada, yada. But actually, that's a a metric prefix for like 10 to the 24 or something like that. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't like to force people to memor, memorize stuff like that. I just, you know, put it on the cover page. Think with it, yes. Memorize it, no. Z88.3. One minute. I haven't dismissed anybody. Thirty seconds. Fifteen seconds. Get your answer in. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five. Four, three, don't leave. Two, one. Stop. Um, it appears we got a lot of geniuses in here. 617 is the answer. Uh, 79% better than the morning class. Homework 16 will be ready by lunchtime tomorrow. Due on Tuesday. See you. 
on Tuesday. You're dismissed. If you insist.